Look, Damien, I think we're both kind of intrigued about today's guest because in every possible way, I think he represents high performance. Yeah, very much. I, the, what, the area that I'm most intrigued to speak to our guest today around is this guy's a true cultural architect. This is a guy that went into an environment and really set the standards and shaped the culture around him. And I'm intrigued to find out a little bit more about that. Right, let's get going then and introduce an 11 times world champion, a six times Olympic champion, the second most decorated Olympic cyclist of all time. Since retiring from cycling, he's set up a successful business, written books, competed in motorsport, taken on charity roles, probably most importantly of all, become a dad. He is relentless. He absolutely is high performance. He is Sir Chris Hoy. Hello. Hello. Nice Thank to see you, you again. Great How to are be you? Here. A cultural architect. I've never been called anything like that before. That's quite exciting. Well, I'll tell you where it comes from. Yeah. Um, so the idea of a cultural architect is somebody that just shapes a culture, like a leader without the title mm -hmm. necessarily, of like, somebody that people look up to. Um, well, that's a very, yeah. Well, I'll tell you where, you. well, it is a pleasure, but I recently met with um, Philip Pines and, oh, um, yeah. and Callum Skinner. Yeah. And it was really significant that they were talking about you in such reverential tones, there was like a real respect in the wow. way that they spoke about the way you dealt with them as young athletes and oh, the nice. example you set, it was very much they saw you as the as the archetype of the standards of wow. British cycling. And they always just take the mickey out of me, I never actually thought they... <laughs> yeah. No, no, behind <laughs> your back, they do speak well, very highly nice. of you, Chris. So, nice. so when we talk then about you being a cultural architect, and we've heard there are a couple of your former teammates think you're exactly that, you know... I know you're super modest, but I need you to kind of, if you wouldn't mind, explain to us what you think they might be referring to. Well, I'm a lot older than them for a start. Yeah. So I guess, um, you know, I was, I was in the team for, well, 36 years. 30, sorry, not, until I was 36. So I was 16 years competing with uh, GB Cycling. So I started out as the youngest member of the team and finished as the oldest. And I think in the last few years, particularly with Phil, Phil came onto the team as a teenager, he came from, he was born in Germany. He's got British parents, but he was born and raised in Germany. He came onto the team two years before the Olympic Games in London. And, you know, for him to come into this high-performance team, to adapt to a whole new environment, a whole different country, um, you know, basically I sort of took him under my wing a little bit and sort of tried to help him and, you know, and integrate him to the team. Selfishly as well, because I saw the potential he had for the team sprint. So I thought, well, he, you know... <laughs> I wasn't just being a nice guy, you know, it was nice to, you always want to try and help the younger athletes, but also I saw the potential he had and I thought, well, this guy could be the missing link to our, our team sprint. We were short of a man one for the, the team sprint and he had the potential. Um, so I guess that was part of it was Phil had, uh, yeah, could, could have been the, the and he, he turned out to be the, that successful link in the team. So when you talk about someone coming into your elite environment, Take us in there if you can. Give us a kind of understanding of what was going on in that team that really, from when you joined, they were kind of also runs in the cycling world to the dominant force on the planet. I guess the biggest single thing that changed in the team um, was, was lottery funding. You know, I was in the team 1994. Um, I got an email, sorry, not an email, I got a letter sent through when I was at university and I was in sort of freshers, freshers mode at that point. I hadn't touched my bike for about two or three months. It was... You know, it was a hobby to me back then, riding a bike. Um, and I got this letter through from Doug Daly saying, we've got this new new velodrome opening in Manchester. We'd like you to come along as part of the, the development squad um, based on your performances at the national championships and the juniors last year. And, uh, you know, sort of literally two weekends a month and that was it. And that was that was enough of a, a lifeline to make me think, well, this is worth training for, continuing with. Because at that point, there was no funding, there was no pathway, there was no coaching. Um, yeah, there was nothing that really gave you any hope at all that you could go on to become successful in your sport. There was, we didn't, up until that point, we didn't have an indoor track. So you couldn't train 12 months of the year. Wow. Um, you know, if you wanted to train 12 months of the year, you had to go abroad. If you went abroad, you had to have money. Um, you had to get sponsorship. But, you know, it's the, you, you didn't have the results to get the sponsorship. So it was this catch-22 situation. So we were all just amateurs, really, you know, just enthusiastic amateurs, doing the best we could. And then the lottery started. We got this new facility in Manchester. We had, you know, I think I got paid ten thousand pounds in my first year, and that Which seemed like rent. a lot of money. Well, that was like a million pounds to me. That yeah. literally was like me winning the lottery. So, based on my performances at you know the Commonwealth Games and national level, they identified me as a potential potential athlete of the future. But not, you know, I hadn't really produced any goods at that point. Um, 
and it was yeah it was just this this it paid allowed me to pay for my rent and food and travel up and down from Edinburgh and that was the lifeline and it gave me that first foot up but you know you'd go to the, the world championships in Manchester in 1996 and you know you had a tracksuit top that you had to you, you borrowed for the week you had to sign out for it you know you, you had this top this grubby top that had been used you know for a few years before different athletes you had um, your own bike, so you borrowed a set of wheels from the team to, to race on. You gave the wheels back after the race. And it was, you know, you just can't... You explain these stories to younger athletes now, and you say to them, this is what it was like, and they, they kind of roll their eyes and think, oh, God, here it goes again about the old days. But it was genuinely proper amateur days. There was no funding, no support. Anyone that was involved was a volunteer. There were two full-time members of staff at that stage, um, and and the lottery was the lifeline. That's what started it all. Money doesn't buy you medals, but it gives you the chance to to get the right facilities, the right equipment, the right people, you know, to help out and to coach. Well, and that was the start of it. The, 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 you often hear athletes when they look back at those. So you'll hear footballers talk about their apprenticeships when they were having to clean boots and mm -hmm. and in your equivalent of having to travel up and down. What lessons do you think you were learning? there during that time I think at that time I realized that you know what this realistically it wasn't about winning medals or, or being the best in the world it was about a journey to see how good I could be it, I never really believed that I was going to become the best in the world not not just because I wasn't the funding or the support but because I didn't believe that I was as good as anybody else I thought you know if I can if I can get lucky here somehow you know, my dream was to, to make the team for the Commonwealth Games or maybe even make the Olympic team if I managed to squeak on there. But it wasn't because I thought, you know, I've got this this um, ability to do, to do it. It was just, yeah, I think it was, uh, at the centre of it, it was a passion. It was a love for what I did. So I just, I loved riding my bike. I loved racing. And I thought if I can do this for as long as possible, I'm living the dream for as long as possible. But eventually the real world will have to sort of kick in and I'll have to get a real job. Um, like my, my great auntie used to, Every time, whenever I won a, a championship or a medal or whatever, you know, you go around and see her and she'd be like, oh, that's fantastic, son, well done, you know. <laughs> when are you going to get a proper job? You know, right. it, was, it was still this mentality of it's just, you're just playing around and having fun. And that's what it was to, to begin with. Um, I that, just, that I, doesn't I feel to me like an elite mentality, though. I, I, I suppose I assumed that you went in there truly believing that you could be world class and truly believing it, that you were going to be the one, the success. No, no? It, it didn't happen until later on. So I think it was... It was a number of things that happened, and it wasn't just one moment. It was a number of stages that I went through to sort of transform from being just a, an enthusiastic amateur to becoming an Olympic champion. And Can you talk us through them? Yeah, sure. Well, I had... Because we didn't really have coaching infrastructure, we didn't have anybody there to tell us what to do. You had to work it out yourself. So I went to uni. I did sports science as my subject. Um, well, I started out doing physics and maths and then changed pretty quickly to sports science. But the sports science was... Again, on the theme of enjoying what you do, I realised that I was I was going to the to the library and I was getting papers out on on sports science essentially to try and learn for myself, to try and learn how to train better, to try and get the best at myself. And I kind of thought, well, what's the point of me doing a degree that I'm not really enjoying? Why don't I do something I've got a passion for? And then I'll, it won't seem like I'm working. So I was doing sports science to learn selfishly to try and make myself a better athlete, not just to get a degree. Then. Craig McLean, my teammate, um, club mate, my friend, he was more of a, a coach and a mentor to me than anything. He just, I, you know, I trained with him all the time and try and desperately keep up with him. And he was my, my benchmark on a really good day. If he was having a bad day, I could just about match his performance. So he was, I don't know what he got from training with me, but I got a lot from training with him because yeah. he helped sort of drag me up um, in the early days. Jason Queeley, um, winning the gold medal in Sydney, you know, Jason... Jason was just an ordinary bloke, this guy who was your mate, your teammate, um, who won a gold medal at the Olympic Games. And it, it changed my view on what Olympic champions mm -hmm. were. Because the Olympic yeah. champions, until that point, we didn't have any in our team, apart from Chris Borman in Barcelona, and he was doing a different event. There was nobody in our, in our event, in the sprint events, who was Olympic champion in our generation, or even, I think, since sort of Reg Harris's time. So... You never had anybody to aspire to. You didn't have a role model. You didn't have someone that you could look at and think, I can emulate them, until Jason came along and won that gold medal in Sydney. And it was it was a bit of a light bulb moment with, with Jason. And I, I thought, well, he's just this ordinary guy, and he's won the gold medal. If he can do it, you know, I don't think I'm the same level as him yet, but maybe I could get close to that. And did you ever I, speak to Jason at that time as well and try and pick his brains? Absolutely, absolutely. So that was the, basically the next year, 
he had kind of a, a year out essentially just doing a bit of a down a down year um and you know having a guy in your team who was the the current olympic champion you know i just basically started picking his brain saying what you know what training should i be doing just learning as much as i could from him and you know a, a measure of what of jason queely as a man as a person um you know initially yeah he was like yeah great i'll help you out and then as time went on i started to improve and get closer to him he didn't then say all right you've come far enough now you know we're going to get we're going to get too close here we're rivals you know you're on your own he still kept on helping me right up to the point that here in manchester 2002 commonwealth games um we were competing separately you know, england and scotland in the same event and he still helped me right up to the the day um mm. and on the night i beat him by a couple of tenths of a second and he was the first person to come over and congratulate me and i remember at the time thinking well if I'm ever in that situation, if I'm ever the old guy, um, you know, this, if the, the reigning champion and someone else comes up and beats me, I want to be able to have that same graciousness and, and attitude yeah. that, so maybe that he, he had. Maybe your cultural architect at that yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Jason, Jason was, you know, a, 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 he was ahead of his time in, the, in his thinking about training for sprint events. Prior to that, it was all about, still, you'd still do lots of miles in the bike, you would do endurance work, um, big volume in the gym and he was about quality you know doing really really short sharp hard efforts but very specific efforts and and changed the way we thought about sprint training but jason was he was the person that that shaped me and gave me the belief that maybe i could do it too and how did you feel the night before that race when it's like luke skywalker taking on (laughs) well I, i just wanted a medal you know even at that point i just remember thinking if i can get close here um to get a Commonwealth Games medal for Scotland was just, you know, a, a really, really right. big target for me. And I won it and I couldn't, I just couldn't believe it. I was still just shocked. You know, I went up quite early on, posted my time because you go on one by one against yeah. the clock. So he was last to go. And I'd, I'd, I thought, well, I've got the silver medal. This is amazing. And then watched his ride and saw him dropping behind me and thinking, well, is this really happening? And then when, you know, when I won the race, it was, it was just, that, that was a big moment. And then eight weeks later, winning the world championship. So I had that belief that, well, I can do this now. I can do it again. And, you know, once you've beaten the Olympic champion, once you believe you can do it, you've only got to prove it once to yourself. Once you can prove that to yourself that it's possible, people can tell you it's possible, but until you actually see it and do it yourself, um, I don't think you necessarily believe it. So that was, yeah, that 2002 was a big year for me and that was when things started to, to shift. So you kind of almost felt in 2002 like the veil had been pulled back. The kind of secret to high performance mm. life was exposed to you at that moment and you realised, hold on a minute, there's no secret to no. this. Anyone can get it and I've just been shown that and, yeah. that and that was it, then you're off. Yeah, and it was, I guess, people like Graham O'Bree, who was a, a big hero of mine. Um, he was a Scottish um, world champion back in the mid-90s in a different event to mine, but he was, you know, for people that haven't heard of him, I would encourage them to, to Google him, and to watch go online, film. watch the film, read his book. An absolute icon in our sport. Um, Intense doesn't begin oh, to... Uh... He's, you know, and everyone focuses on his, his ingenuity about, you know, creating his bike. He used to build, build his bikes himself out of scrap metal. He used to weld them together with his own two hands. He created a, you know, two different riding positions, completely different, without, you know, wind tunnels and, and scientists to help him. He came up with these new ideas. But for me, it was it was his approach to training, his commitment to every single session. And I watched a video, there was a documentary that's on YouTube about him and Chris Boardman called The Contenders, I think Battle of the Bikes. And there's a scene there where he's, he's just absolutely destroying himself on this old rusty static trainer in his backyard. And when you see somebody really digging deep, and I saw him training once and just watched, just, just saw how much commitment he threw into every single session. It wasn't because it was, there was a world title on the line, it was just a Wednesday afternoon. And this is how he trained every single day. And I remember thinking, I'm not doing that yet. I, I need to, to switch that kind of mode in my head and have that intensity in every single session. So and how old were you when? I was about 18 or 19, or right. maybe 19, 20 at that point and realising this is how I need to train. So it takes time. You can't just do that overnight. But yeah. that was the moment I thought I need to start really committing. And so at the heart of everything I did was every single effort of every single session counts. So, you know, as, if you get to the start line knowing there's nothing more that you could have done within your powers to be the best you can be, then you can accept the result. You can shake the guy's hand if he beats you. But if you turn up at the start line, looking back, thinking, well, there was that session six months ago that I really chickened out of when it got really painful. Yep. Uh, you know, no one else knew, but I know that I didn't go 100%. 
or there was a stag deal went on, you know, three months ago that I probably shouldn't have done and had a big night and I, you know, whatever. It's, it's, it's knowing there's nothing, you know, within your powers, if you can truly say you've done everything you can possibly do, then you can relax in the day. It's a bit like studying for your exams. If you've done the work, yeah. you can enjoy the experience and, you know, whatever happens, happens. Well, can I ask you a question on that, Chris? Because we've heard a lot of elite performers like yourself speak about this idea of squeezing every drop and, mm -hmm. and, and, and giving it. So for somebody listening to this that is, is having a bad day or, you know, when they've come home after a long day at work and they're exhausted and mm -hmm. they've got that choice of sitting on the sofa or going out for a run, how did you get, compel yourself to, to squeeze that drop out of you, that every drop? I think it was knowing that, that, that literally every effort counts. And if you weren't training right now, your rivals will be training. Right. And I didn't, I think it's because I almost, I didn't see myself as having the same potential as other people. So I thought, you know, I have to work so much harder to get the result compared to, you know, I, I hate the word talent because it, it, it kind of gives the impression that you just turn up and you're good at whatever it is you do. When it doesn't matter who you are, you know, it could be Usain Bolt, he still has to train like a demon to, to, to make those, yeah. to produce those performances. So I, I, I guess I felt like I almost had to work harder than everybody else to, to get the results. Um, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but that was the, that was the belief that I had. Right. Um, and that pushed me on. But I also, I didn't enjoy the pain. I didn't enjoy the actual moment of suffering through a session, but I, I enjoyed the feeling of getting through a day and feeling I'd taken a step towards that end goal. So I would have, every day I would have a target. It wouldn't just be this, this great big target on the horizon in four years' time. Every single day I would have a plan. I would have targets within that session, knowing exactly what numbers I had to hit or you know, the, the kind of output I'd have to produce to have a good session. Everything was measurable. And I'm quite scientific in the way I approach things. I like to have numbers and figures and, and data. So I would, I would look at everything and I would you know, I'd plan it out beforehand and I would log it and then I would see that little step towards that end goal. So I quite enjoyed that whole process. It wasn't just about winning medals. I actually enjoyed the process of doing it. I loved doing what I did. I didn't, as I say, I didn't love the pain of sure. the sessions, but when they were over, yeah, it was a great feeling. And once you were sort of opened up to this growth mindset of believing that it was within your grasp, mm -hmm. no excuses, the opportunity is yours if you want mm -hmm. to take it, how many times did you give up? when training, when working? Give up in terms of in the session or never, never, you know, you, I, I never. So, if, I, well, I, you, but you were involved in British cycling for what, 16 years? 16 years, yeah. You, you didn't once just go, nah, this is. No, no, there was, wow. there was, there was, there was points. So it becomes, it becomes a point where um, you can push yourself too hard. You know, it, it could be like a racehorse. You just keep going and going until you fall down. So. You need to trust. In the early years, I didn't have coaches who, who I trusted. and We didn't have them full stop. So once you start having a coach around you, you take, it takes time to begin to trust them and know that they have the right judgment. So when the coach says to you, right, I think you've done enough now, you're, you know, you're, you're clearly needing a rest, the instinct was always to push on and now nah, I'm fine, I'm fine. And part of it was to prove that you could do it and it was a, to show that you were strong and show to yourself as well. But it was, yeah, it was just this, nev you, you never gave up. You would never you would never back down. It was always, if you're, in a, if you're not going well, the solution was to train harder, which is ridiculous, really. You know, it's, it's great to have that mentality to push hard, but it's recognising when to train and when to rest. And that was one thing that Jason Creeley really taught me. He, was, he used to rest way more than anybody else, which I found bizarre. And yet he would keep, you know, he'd, he'd be sort of lying on the sofa in a training camp, sleeping all day. And you'd be like, when are you going to do any training? He's like, I'm not ready for training yet. Or, you know, I've not got over the flight yet. Or that session this morning has really knocked me back a bit. I need to recover. And he was a bit older than us at that time, where I still is. Um, but to me, it was learning the difference or the, learning when to push and when to rest. So the coaching staff really helped me. In later years, they would say, right, you know, look at the numbers today. You're dropping off a cliff here. The times are getting slower and slower. There is no point in training when you're, when you're this fatigued. You've got to rest. And it took me years to get to that point where I go, okay, I'll, I agree. But I would never be the one to say, I think I should stop now because I'm, I'm getting, you know, the, the times aren't great or I'm, I'm suffering So how do you much. do that now then, Chris? So, like, how do you know when to ease off a bit and give yourself a now, break? Because you're um, busy packed. Yeah, you? well, I think now it's, it's, it's just so different now because life, life went from being a, a single focus and everything else had to fit around it or, you know, literally just didn't exist. So you didn't, you, everything had to be about training and recovery and diet and competition. And now it's, it's about, I guess, enjoying variety and balance and having 
so many different things to do. But as Jake mentioned at the start, becoming a dad as well. When you become a parent, then the shift becomes your kids, and they are the centre of everything, and your work and your rest of your life fits around that. So um, I guess, yeah, when you have a really busy period like now, it's, it's difficult to say no to stuff. So you have so many great opportunities, you want to do things, you don't know how, many, how long the opportunities are going to be there for, so you don't want to turn things down and then regret it in the future. So now it's about, I guess, being efficient in how you do stuff, planning in advance, making sure that, well, if I want to do all these things, I've got to be sure that I can get from A to B, to C to D in a, as, a, as you know, easy way as possible um, and, and try and fit it all in. But, but equally, if you do too much, you become tired and run down and you can't, you, you can't do it all and you can't do it well. So I'd rather do less stuff but do it well than do too much and, yeah. and do it half-heartedly. Could we talk about when your son Callum was born? Mm. Because you went from being an elite athlete, which I don't know, but I assume is quite a selfish life, right? Everything yeah, absolutely. Everything you, your yep. training, your nutrition, your travel, mm -hmm. your medals, your targets. And almost overnight, you go and you see the doctor and they say, right, we need to get this baby out mm. three months before your baby was due to be born. Your wife then became ill, your mm. baby was ill. And suddenly you've gone from the most important person in your world to the least important person. Yeah. Because it becomes about them. How was that mindset shift for you? Um, I guess it, it wasn't even a, a conscious thing, but you, you just, like anything in life, when really important stuff happens, you just deal with it. Um, so it was, yeah, it was, it was obviously when you, Sarah was pregnant and it, you know, fantastic. It was all going to be great. Um, I hadn't even, you know, painted as, we didn't know whether it was going to be a boy or a girl. We hadn't done anything yet. It was, you know, literally naively thinking we've got lots of time and then out the blue Sarah became unwell and Callum was born at 29 weeks and yeah it was I guess even before then I, I guess life had shifted from being this, a selfish focused athlete a little bit but that was a big step to suddenly do you know what this this little thing who you know he was two pounds when he was born two pounds two ounces he was tiny and he was in hospital for the first sort of eight nine weeks of his life and it's I guess then everything, you know, perspective comes in. And Steve Peters, who was our, our psychologist in the team, used to talk about perspective a lot and used to try and, before a big event, you know, you'd, I mean, I was seeing Steve once a week before London. You know, people are quite surprised when they learn how much time you spend with a psychologist. But, um, you know, it, it's like saying, well, you can go, you, you can't just walk into a gym, pick up a dumbbell and get strong after one session. It's, you know, psychology is like anything else in your overall training. You have to work on these techniques to become um, better at them. So for perspective, Steve would be saying things like, well, do you know what, you're, you're riding a bike in anti-clockwise circles around the track. It's not, it's not life and death here. You know, at, trying to get some perspective on what it is you do. You've got to care about it. You've got to be passionate about it, but also learn that it is quite trivial. And then you can deal with the big events and think, do you know what, this is okay. But when it comes to something that, that is life and death and that, you know, it is properly stressful... Um, it's not easy. But, but you'd also gone from control. Like the mm, one thing you yeah. have when you're an athlete, you're in control of everything. Yeah. And now you have control of nothing at all, don't you? Yeah. It's, and you want answers too. So you're, you know, you're used to looking at data. You're used to, look, used to looking at stuff that is quite black and white. Um, and it's, yeah, the doctors can never give you any guarantees or they don't, you know, they say, well, we just have to wait and see. And, you know, it takes time. And it, it, it's, and I guess as well, sitting, doing nothing, you've got very little control over the situation. You know, you're, you're, you just sit and watch this little baby in an incubator for hours a day and you get to change his nappy, you know, and you get to take him out and do a bit of skin to skin and that's it. But he's got tubes and wires and cables and all sorts. And he's so fragile, you're terrified you're going to hurt him. So it's, it's, it was without doubt the hardest period of our lives. And it's, it, it wasn't like it just sort of, stopped you know that it was a very gradual thing like now he's he's five and he's at school and he's doing really well um but you still you know you never then sort of stop worrying you worry about your kids regardless of what the situation is but but i guess the, going back to the point yeah it's your whole world shifts and your perspective and your priorities change and yeah you do have to be selfish as an athlete i think if you want to be the best in the world at something then you have to put that first um so i have no idea how athletes when they, you know, during their career can have families. Like Roger Federer, I mean, how many kids has he got now? You know, you think, Four children. how does he manage? You know, yeah, it's yeah. incredible, incredible that, that not just him, but his, his wife and his family around him, that they can make that happen. Jason Kenny and Laura Kenny, um, both trying to win, you know, they're, well, Jason's got six gold medals, Laura's got four. You know, they could potentially come back with another six gold medals between them in, uh, in Tokyo. 
and they've got a child to, to look after and care for. You know, I, I, I've got huge respect for people that are able to balance the two and do them both well. So what intrigues me, Chris, is that, like, even when you're talking there <coughs> around becoming a dad, there's very much a, a sense of there's a plan, there's a meticulous process mm -hmm. that you follow. When do you ever just let yourself not follow the process and just let life take you? Um, I, I guess that's what's kind of happened a lot more since I've retired. And it was the, the biggest, the most liberating feeling when you retire, or for me, certainly, was not worrying about how you were feeling. So every, like when you were training and competing, every day you wake up and your body's aching. You know, you, the only time you don't ache is in this two weeks before competition when you start to taper off and you're resting more because every other moment of the, the four year cycle, you're, you're, you are suppressed by this fatigue. You're, you're training your body so hard, you can't afford to be fresh all the time. You've got, you've got to work, work, work. So that, that period when you finish and you get out of bed and you walk up a set of stairs and normally you're thinking about how your legs are feeling and thinking towards the next session and how this is, you know, I'm not recovered from the last one. What's the next session going to be? What am I doing? You kind of go, it's this feeling of, it doesn't matter. It really, it's, it doesn't matter. You know, there's... And it, is that liberating it, or it scary? Is. It's both. Because, it, you know, you, you liberating because you feel, finally, um, you can just sort of breathe out and go, do you know what? Um, and it makes it sound like I wasn't enjoying it. I had an amazing career, amazing time, so much, so many great people I met, so many great experiences, but there is, there's, you know, there's no denying there's a lot of pressure and a lot of expectation which you put on yourself um, to do as well as you can. But then when you retire, you know, I went to, went to America shortly after I retired and you've got to fill in the little green card and, you know, name and address occupation. And the first time where you kind of go for 20 years, whatever, written cyclist, and all of a sudden it's like, well, who, yeah. what, what am I? You know, what, how do you define yourself? You define yourself by what you do. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, you're an ex-cyclist. That's what I used to do. So it's, yeah, there, there's all sorts of things that you have to come to terms with when you retire. And normally these are things you deal with, you know, 30, 40 years later. But for sports people, they, they deal with it and they, they confront this, this sense of, well, what's my identity? You know, what am I going to do now? So for me, it was always about, again, a little bit of a plan before I retired. What, what was I going to do when I retired? So there wasn't that moment of... Um, I guess, just wondering, you know, what next? And, and, you know, you see a lot of athletes do struggle when they retire. If you sure. don't have a plan, if you don't have something that you're keen to get your teeth into, then it can, uh, it can be quite a troublesome time. So what did you write down then? For post-cycling? On, on, on that green card? Oh, um, I can't, do you know what? I can't remember. <laughs> I can't, I, I, Unemployed. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You're too young to write retire, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, I think I still wrote cyclist just because there was a queue behind me and I couldn't think of something. But yeah, it was, that was the first moment I really had to sort of deal with that wow you know what's what is what is the future going to hold what am I going to do you know I, I don't want to spend your whole life looking backwards and talking about the old days and I realize the irony that we are doing that right yeah, now yeah. but um yeah you want to you want to have new challenges and new things to look forward to so um yeah it's it's you do have to stop and smell the roses every now and again but equally you want to keep moving on and having new challenges and new targets because yeah it's that's what life's about so what would you write down today then today I would write um Company director, probably something dull like that. <laughs> yeah. Have you not taken, though, everything you learned from British Cycling into being a company director? I'm, I'm interested to know what learnings there have been from your sporting career that has now turned your hoy bikes into such a success. Well, I, I think the key thing is when I was competing, I was always looking at the best guys in the world. What, what are they doing? How are they performing well? Um, from a little kid as a BMX or watching the older kids in BMX through to track cycling to the Jason Queeley and you know watching him win the Olympics I always used to look to the best guys to analyze their techniques and their training methods and I guess business is no different you know, you look at what else is in the market who's doing well how are they doing it can we do it as well as that can we do it better what you know it, it's learning from the best I think is a good starting point um, but also realizing that you're starting a whole, you're on the bottom rung of a whole new ladder. You can't expect to come straight in in the middle of the top. It's, but with that, it's quite exciting because you're, you know, you've been doing something at the very top level, but with minimal headroom for improvement for so long. You're looking at the tiniest fractions, whereas every time you do something new, you, you take big, big steps. You're on that steep part of the learning curve. Um, it's quite a, quite a fun part of, uh, part of the journey. I think. The one word that sort of springs to mind when we talk about your entire career from starting out to now running businesses is courage. Because I think you mm -hmm. really have to have courage to put yourself into that British cycling setup. 
You've got to have courage to try and be one of the leaders in there. You've got to have courage when you're on the start line, courage when you retire, courage when your mm. child and wife are both seriously mm. ill. And then when you've done all that, where you could just chill out and sit in your garden all day, you then have to have courage again to go, right, I'm going to set up a bike company. I'm not only that, I'm going to be courageous enough to put my name to it so that <laughs> if it doesn't work out and it is a failure, it's crystal clear who's had this failure. Hadn't considered that. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it's going well. I think you're okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's. I, I but don't know. Do you feel like Cor- a courageous no. person? I, Does that? I think th- there's times when you do. Like there's times when you walk onto the track, like particularly things like the sprint or the Kieran, um, as an event, they're really gladiatorial. There's there's just this. It's not like doing a, a bunch race where there's thirty other people with you and you can sort of hide in the bunch. Not not that you hide in the bunch, but it's you're stepping up and you're either going to win or you're going to lose. You know, in a, in a sprint scenario, there's there's two of you. It's very man on man, toe to toe kind of thing. Um, and you've got to go in there with the kind of fighting spirit and the, the you've got to have courage because if you don't, they'll dominate the race and you'll lose. So there were moments where I remember thinking, like London, rolling up on the start line in the Kieran final, it was like, whew, you know, there's a lot of expectation here. Um, this is this is a big moment. But realising that, you know what, I'm so lucky to have this chance because you can either look at it as a, a burden and the pressure and the weight of the world on your shoulders or you can go... This is amazing. You know, this is an Olympic Games, Olympic Games final. The crowd are all, 90% of the crowd are cheering for me. This is something that mo- not many athletes ever get the chance to do. So make them... You had that clarity, did you? Only, only with a lot of work. It didn't, it didn't come, you know, instantly or, or easily. It was with, with Steve Peters, with the work I was doing with him. It was about having perspective and understanding how your brain is going to try and, you know, jeopardise everything. It's going to try and jump into the fight or flight mode it's going to try and become emotional it's going to try and react to things around you but if you expect these things and you have a plan for what you want to think about and how you can control them and ideally switch on the, the kind of autopilot um, then you'll give yourself the best chance of, of performing well but it wasn't it wasn't like we were walking around like robots the whole time it was the ability to, to switch if you lost focus to switch back into focus and you were doing that hundreds of times a day maybe thousands of times a day which is as, as exhausting as it sounds. You get to the end of the day. Like, How do you do it? Um, with with practice, by having you know you, you would sit down and every everyone's different, but with Steve you would have you would talk through scenarios of of you know stressful environments and racing. What could happen? What might happen? You know how would you deal with that? How would you um, address these these worries or concerns with logic? And you would do it so many times that it becomes an automatic thing. You don't have to. You know, it's very clunky in the in the first first few days, the first few times you try it. And the trouble is you don't have these big pressurized moments every day. So you can't go out and just practice them willy nilly. You've got to use them on things like, you know, if you're out driving the car and someone cuts you up, not reacting to that, understanding you know, yep. what, what benefit is there going to be from blowing the horn or shouting or chasing after them. If you're on the phone trying to pay a gas bill and you've been on the phone for 20 minutes and you, you're being held in the queue and then you get cut off and you want to chuck the phone out the window, well, what's the point of doing that? And it's, these are the things you would use to try and use these little annoying parts of the day to, to test your, your, your control and your ability to, to focus and not get emotional. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was using any situation that you could. And in training as well, there were times, you know, things like when you're leading up to a major championship and particularly within the team, the pressure within the team and the, the, the competition within the team, um, you're fighting for places. Like for me and Jason Kenny, only one rider was going to get a, a sprint spot. Only one rider would get the Kieran spot for London. So your teammate is, you know, you're basically number one and number two in the world and you're training together, you're sharing a room together in the hotels, at the village, everywhere. And it's very easy to start watching what he's doing and, and keeping an eye on his times and looking at his performances. But as soon as you start getting distracted and looking at what he's doing, you're, you're not giving the focus to yourself. So having the ability not to... Not to get distracted. That's and a life lesson, not just a yeah, thriving lesson, yeah. isn't it? But it strikes me that Jake's theme about courage that he, that he attributed to you before, Chris, that it was courageous to go and seek Steve out. And it sounds courageous that you kept going it and recognised it was a process. How rare was that, the willingness to work on the psychological side as well as <laughs> the physical and the tactical? Yeah, it was really... When Steve joined the team in 2002 or three. Nobody, like he just sat in his office and no one was knocking on his door. It took Jason Queeley um, to go and start seeing him, right. who was seen as a senior member of the team, one of our kind of main guys. And, and Steve came, uh, sorry, and Jason came back and was saying, that was really interesting. He's, he's a fascinating guy. And, we, you know, 
what did you do? You know, were you lying on a sofa talking about your childhood and stuff? And he's like, <laughs> no, we just sat and had a chat. And, and I think back in those days, the, the, the notion of a psychologist, it was almost this sort of, ooh, you know, it's a sign of weakness to go and see a psychologist. Is it a sign, you know, there's a chink in your armor, you need to see somebody. It was, it was a, a bit of a taboo back yeah. then. And that's, what, 15, 16 years ago. And it, you think how much it's changed now. But if you so had you a broken... it has changed? I do think it has. Because if you, you know, in those days, if you had a broken bike, you'd go and see the mechanic. If you had an injury, you'd go and see the physio. But you would, you would only go and see a psychologist if there was a really serious problem and, and it was like last resort. Whereas now, it's... People are, you know, not just the athletes, the, the team were queuing up, you know, the, the, the coaches, the coaching staff, anybody in the building would sort of knock on Steve's door just asking advice because he was just such a, he, he was the kind of person that everybody respected. He was a sounding board. He, he was able to sort of conflicts between people within the teams. So if he had two riders that were having a tough time together, he would sit them down and he would sort of sort it out. And because everybody respected him equally, they would, you know, they would sort of take what he said as gospel and say, right, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll follow what you say, we'll give it a go. But it took time. And I think with, with Steve, um, yeah, it was, it was because other writers were going to see him that I thought, well, maybe I will go and see him and have a chat. And, and he actually came to me in, it was in 2004, it was the first time really he sort of engaged or re-engaged together. He, he came to see me in, at the Celtic Manor um, about three weeks before the Olympics in Athens. Right. And he said, have you got time for a quick chat? And I was like, yeah, yeah, of course, you know, sat down, had a coffee. What were you thinking at he that said, point? Well, I was thinking, why is he coming, you know, what? <laughs> this is a bit weird, but I thought maybe he was just, you know, just doing the rounds to check everyone was okay. And he said, you know, how are things going? And I said, oh, it's going really well, you know, brilliant. Injury free, form's good. I retain, I re regain my world title um, this year. So, you know, I'm going to be starting number one seed at the Olympics in three weeks time, dead happy, you know ready to go for it and he said that's that's brilliant really pleased that you know you've turned it around this year it's gone well um, and he said I just want to pose one scenario to you you know what are you going to do if somebody breaks the world record right before you get on the track and the event I was doing the kilo you're against the clock one by one and I would be last to go so I would see all my rivals post their times and he's you know I said well I, I just won't think about it and he said well if I say to you right now don't think about a pink elephant what is the first thing that pops into your head? And this, this pink elephant popped into my head. And I thought, right, well, he's got my attention or he's doing some sort of mind control <laughs> technique on me. Um, I said, all right, well, what, what, what should I do then if I, if I shouldn't not think about it? He said, well, you can't not think about something. You have to, you know, you can only want to think about one thing at any one time. And if you say don't think about something, you get drawn towards it. So you have to actively choose what you want to think about and that will displace any other thoughts. Cognitive displacement, I think it, it's called. Um, so he said, you know, what, what I would like you to do between now and the games in the next three weeks, every time you get anxious or stressed about anything, it doesn't have to be about the cycling, I want you to visualise that the race, this one kilo time trial, from your perspective, in real time, from start to finish. So it takes about a minute. And just visualise yourself doing the perfect performance, that perfect ride. I was like, all right, thank you. Well, that's nothing new. Visualisation is nothing groundbreaking. Went back to the room, logged onto the internet, and it was uh, the Cycling News website. One of the, my rivals had posted some great time, um, you know, in training. And I suddenly thought, oh, God, he's gone really well. And he's going to be flying in three weeks. Time. I thought, oh, wait a minute. Don't engage with this negative thought. Let's just shut my eyes, visualize, you know, rehearse this, this race. And at the end of the minute, I was like, oh, I feel all right. And just moved on. And then as the days went on, as I got closer to the, to the games before we got out to Athens, okay. it was just getting more and more and more. I was doing this more and more times. And then on the night itself, it was just this almost constant loop of, you know, visualizing this race because there's so much stress and so much stuff happening around you. So it doesn't allow, if you're just constantly choosing what you're thinking about, the negative anxious thoughts don't have a, an, an in, they can't get in. And then as if he had a crystal ball, four riders to go, Shane Kelly stepped up and wrote the world record. And again, used the technique to sort of push that out. The next guy, Stefan Nimka, same again, went even faster. And then as I'm sitting about to get on the bike, one rider to go, Arno Tourneau went even quicker, new Olympic record, new world record, all that stuff. But it was having that technique and having that ability to say, do you know what, it doesn't matter what... There must have been a little bit. Oh, there's no, the, shit. Well, there was, but that's the what point. So it, it would happen and then you would, just, you, would, you would... It wasn't that you were able to be completely calm. Right. There was this, oh my God, and then just keep going, just hang on to this one thing. This is your, your lifeline, grip onto this. Don't allow the panic to set in. 
you've got no control over what they've done. There's nothing that you can do to affect that Olympic record. Okay. Focus on yourself. No, just for context, Chris, can I ask that mm. the year before at the World Championships? Yeah. Had they been a similar yes, scenario? They've gone, yeah, exactly. Right. So, yeah, um, good point. Yeah, the, so in, in 2002, I'd won the Worlds. So I went into the 2003 World Championships as defending champion, starting off final seed, like last rider. And one of the German riders early on had posted a really fast time, um, and that had got to me. I looked at the time and thought, bloody hell, that's way fast than I've ever gone before. I'm going to have to attack this. I'm going to have to go out so hard at the start to try and get ahead, get up on the pace. So he affected your plan. He changed my whole game plan yeah, yeah. because I, I, instead of realising, well, the environment, you know, the, the, the conditions are fast, it's really warm, it's a good track, just stick to the game plan. I reacted to his performance and changed my game plan and I, I came fourth. Right. So, you know, I had a really poor performance there and that was what Steve was concerned about, that he was going to see, well, you, you're going to start last again here. How are you going to deal with a similar situation? But I don't think anybody really expected the three guys, all three, before to break the world record and raise the bar each time so a pb would have only got me third place um at the you know but as i lined up at the start line in athens so it was it, you know it was just in terms of pressure in terms of the script the way that it was you know leading towards his final ride normally i think that would have been too much and i'd have been distracted and panicking about what they were doing but i managed to focus on myself you know what i think is great about this is that there are people listening to this going well that's brilliant advice but i'm not a professional cyclist so no use to me is it but actually we now live in a world where particularly with social media what do we do all the time compare ourselves to everybody else yeah. mm. so what should we then be doing pushing that aside and focusing on ourselves yeah. and whether it's your wife going oh look at the lovely life my friends are living on instagram <laughs> or your kids coming home from school yeah. going I mean, my daughter does dance and someone got a gold and she got a silver and mm. that really bothered her for, a, for an mm. amount of time. This is the kind of advice mm. that no matter who you are, whatever your walk of life, using that technique yep. suddenly puts you back in control. And I think to own your own thoughts means you're, you're owning your own actions, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think understanding what you have control over in life is a big, uh, important step to, to kind of overcome and once you realize that there's so many things you can't control there's so many things that why worry about stuff that you you literally cannot control focus on what you can do if you do it to the best of your ability like i mentioned earlier on there's, there's only so much you can do we can all do sometimes it's enough sometimes you can win with it sometimes you can achieve what you want but not always but if you've genuinely done the best you can you can possibly do then you've got to pat yourself on the back and say and you know if you get beaten then you, you shake the guy's hand and you say, well, I'm going to come back better next time. Well done. You know, you don't have to make excuses. One of the things I used to hate, I still do, is watching sport and seeing the, the losing side or the losing athlete stepping up in front of the camera and then just complaining and making excuses and the referee or I've got this injury or I've got this. Don't, nobody, you know, you're not going to change their opinion. You're not going to make them think, oh, well, you should have won then. Yeah. It's just, it's just, it comes across really poorly. And you look at someone like Roger Federer, whether he wins or loses, he, he comes off the court he congratulates his opponent. He talks about them. He says how good they are. He and you kind of think, you know, to me, it's it's all about just you know accepting responsibility for your own performance, not making excuses. And if you do lose, you say, I'm going to come back stronger next time. Well done to him. He's done really well. Enjoy the moment. But I will be back, and I will, you know, you better so be better was next it time. Then, Chris, with your little fella, was it what? Sorry. So as a father, then, uh -huh. how early have you started? teaching these lessons to him i don't know if i have um you, you, you <laughs> the day's so busy doing trying to get him to school and get him back and get their dinner in them and get him to bed yeah I, I don't know i think subconsciously i hope these messages are coming through it's i mean you must be saying to him that's not your fault mate oh yeah it's your responsibility yes. to deal with it yeah you know? well it's I, I don't know i guess it's 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 not about sport it's not it's just it's life isn't it it's about trying yeah. to to bring your kids up in a way that you hope they're equipped to deal with stuff and make their own decisions and and you worry about doing too much for them or they're not doing enough for them and you know you, you, it's, there's so much pressure on parents to do the right the right thing and everywhere there's information and everywhere people are doing things differently and again like social media like you were saying before you can you can beat yourself up and you can be like a deer in the headlights worrying about all these different options of what should I be doing I guess at some point you've got to just choose your path, stick to it, commit to it, and do the best you can. What was the information or the advice that Steve gave you about dealing with setbacks <coughs> in your career? So whether um, it's when you were brilliant at the kilo and they just took it away from the mm. Olympics and you had to refocus, mm. or when you had injuries or accidents and you were off the bike for a period of time and you saw all your teammates 
improving and improving mm. and you're you're unable to compete. What what is what was the advice from Steve about dealing um, with setbacks? Setbacks, I, I guess it comes back to you know, dealing with what you have control over. So it's it's having patience, it's having, you know, resetting your goals. Um for injuries, it's the most frustrating thing that in sport, I think, for any athlete, an injury because all you want to do is train. All you, you know, your, your default setting is to push on, to do more, to train harder. And when you can't, it's it's just like you're you know you're you're kind of a in a situation where you're the frustration's building. You haven't and you don't realise how much physical activity it can affect your mental state as well. You're used to doing it all the time, and if you suddenly have to stop training and you miss that that daily endorphin release, you miss that activity then you can see the athletes start to get down, they can start to get frustrated with the situation, but also the fact they're not actually doing any exercise. So um, for me, when I was injured, I was very lucky. I really only had one period where it was a really bad, proper, you know, lay off the bike, you know, 10 weeks of doing nothing at all. The rest of the time, the injuries were all ones you're managing, you know, you're going to see the physio every day, but you could still modify your training. But I guess setbacks were resetting your goals, you know, looking at where are you now, what happened, learn from your mistakes, and the mistakes are often, you know, it's a cliche to say you learn more from your mistakes than your victories, but I, I truly believe that's the case. So People try and avoid failure. Yeah, know? yeah, they do. They don't. Did you have to seek it when you were competing? Um, no, I think failure comes to you eventually. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You know, it's, it's I guess, I, I never believed that I was invincible. Some athletes did. And as Steve Peters used to say, the Father Christmas syndrome, you know, you, once you realise he doesn't exist, you can't then go back to believing in him. And if you believe you're invincible, and that's your that's your whole mindset, and then you lose, you just, all, all you got to do is lose one race. And once you've lost that one race, that whole mindset, that whole belief system has gone because you can't go back to believing you're invincible once you've been beaten. Father so Christmas the, mindset. I'd not but, heard that before. So I was I was talking about this at an event um, that I thought were just they were just for adults, and I, halfway through oh, talking about this, oh, no. and I saw I saw I saw a parent <laughs> like going. No, <laughs> and she was putting her hands over, and I like re, sort of rewound it. Which, of course, Father Christmas panic, does panic. exist, as we all know. Um, and <laughs> backpedaled like a maniac. Um, I think I, I think I saved it, but um, no traumatized kids there. But yeah, it was. Yeah, I think with I forgot what the point of the question, but the point of the response was. Um, yeah, I, I guess failure for me. If once you've got a winning, what you see is a winning formula you can be frightened to change and to make any changes. And certainly after 2002, when I won the Commonwealth Games and the Worlds, I had a fantastic season, a real breakthrough season. I thought I'd cracked it. I thought, this is the formula. This is what I need to do. If I train this way again, if I eat this way again, if I rest this way again, this will produce the winning medal next year. But what, all that happens is you raise the bar and then all the guys that are behind you, they're chasing after you and they, they, they raise the bar further. So you've got to continuously improve yourself. And by doing that, you have to change just not everything. You don't change, you know, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, but you, you make little changes to the things that can be improved and you keep the things that are really structural, yeah. you know, important to the overall thing. So and when you lose, you've got nothing to be afraid of changing. Whereas when you're winning, you're, you're frightened to change because you think, sure. I've got the winning formula. But what, what intrigues me towards the latter end of your career, Chris, is that if we go back to the way you described those early days where you had frames of reference, so you had Jason Queeley setting an example, you had mm -hmm. Graham Mowbray where you could see the work ethic that's mm -hmm. gone on there. When you start getting into the territory of being a multiple Olympic champion, where were your frames of reference there to dictate how do you behave, how do you conduct yourself? Um, in terms of behaviour and conducting yourself, I think it, it was, I don't know, I, I guess it's what you instinctively feel is, is right for yourself. Um, the, the, without doubt the hardest four years of my career was from post Beijing to, to London because no matter what you, you can sort of tell yourself at the time I was 32 after Be or in Beijing and 36 in London that was you know the, very much the, the back end of my career um, in terms of your age you know the, you keep saying oh, age is just a number and blah 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 and, and to a certain extent that's true um, no other athlete had won a gold medal in a sprint event, individual sprint event, um, after the age of, I think, 30. And I was 36 going into, into London. So I kept saying, you know, it doesn't matter. They're not, you know, as long as I keep performing, it's great. But I was noticing that my recovery wasn't as great as it had been. So I could still put out one-off efforts that were as good or better than I've ever done before. But it took me a long time to get over that. 
And I guess it was understanding that maybe I'm not able to do five days of competition with three different medal events. Maybe I'm going to have to just pick two and have a rest in the middle. And I would never have chosen that. Um, but thankfully, in a way, it was great that Jason was picked over me for the sprint because it meant that I could focus on the Kieran at the end and the team sprint at the start and allow myself to recover. If we'd had two riders per nation allowed, I would have done both events. And the chances are that I might not have won gold in either because it might have been too much to deal with. But it was, yeah, I think towards the end of my career, you start to become a bit more reflective. And I think you try and draw on everything you've learned in your, in your early years and bring it together. And physically, you're, you might be starting to plateau or even drop off, but you're, you, all the experiences, all the knowledge, understanding your body, when to rest, when to train, how to deal with the pressure, knowing that when you get on the start line, you've been there before, you've, you've, you draw upon these experiences and they help you. So whilst some, certain things are dropping off, other things are, are gaining and you're getting, getting better at it. Your big moment was being on the start line. And obviously you had Worlds and Euros and things, but the Olympics was what your sport was yeah. really all about. It was built around the Olympics. So effectively, four years of training and creating and developing and getting better for the Olympic Games. Now, most people listening to this won't compete in Olympic Games, but they will still have things that they build up to mm -hmm. and they have to deliver on the day. Mm -hmm. So can you talk us through your mindset on the day of an Olympic final and what, what you're thinking as you're sitting on the start line I mean, as you just said, you're pushing everything else away apart from the race itself. But yeah. what is the process of making sure that four years of effort is not thrown away in 60 seconds? It's, and do you even allow yourself to consider it, that? It's, I guess the point is that you, you can't magic a performance out of nowhere. It's not that you, know, you can go and see a psychologist and they will give you the tools to sort of, you know, produce something that you, you, you could never have done before on the day. But what, you, what you, tends to happen is people underperform. So you... You, know, you get to the big, big occasion and the stress gets to you, you get distracted, you change your game plan for whatever reason, you underperform. So the key is it's just about having the tools to do what you know you can do, but do it under the most extreme uh, pressure of situations. So when you're on the start line, for me, it was, it was almost a relief of thinking, well, I've got here, you know, all the things that can go wrong, all the injuries you can pick up. You, even at the final, the final few days in an athlete's village, all these people from all around the world come and stay in this really close, confined space, bringing all these germs and you know, bugs and stuff. The, the triathlon team, the British triathlon team in Beijing all got wiped out with a diarrhea and vomiting bug. And we were sharing the same block as them. So you arrive and you're told this, and we say, we can't stay anywhere else. We've got to stay in here. We're going to have to go in full on, you know, hand gel mode. That's where Clive Woodward was running around. That was one of the yeah. rules, wasn't yeah. it? Never walk past a hand gel yeah. station. Yeah. You, know. you know, hand gels, you don't shake hands, you don't touch lift buttons, you don't hold banisters, you don't use door handles, you know, literally it's... it's. So you stand at the lift waiting for other names. <laughs> yeah. Someone else will use get your elbow. to come and get a bug. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's true, you know, you, there's, there's so much stress leading up to it and you put so much work into it, you get paranoid that it's all going to fall apart in the last minute. In, in Athens, um, six days before I raced, I was out on my final, I'd done a really, the last really painful session on the static bike in the, in the apartment in the village. And I'd, I'd nailed it and I'd produced a PB power output by a couple of watts and I was just like, I'm, I've done it now. It's all in the bank, the work is done. And I went out for a kind of cool down ride just around the village. And as I came up to the little roundabout, there was a bus coming towards it and the bus didn't stop and I had to sort of, Make, you know, take a, a, a evasive action and it was really hot tarmac as well in Athens 40 degree heat really slippy I just basically lost lost control of the bike slid out hit the deck and I for a split second I thought I'd broken my wrist oh. and it was just this moment of oh my god I can't believe wow. I've got this close and it's all falling apart I was fine I'd lost lots of skin on my side but my bones were fine but you suddenly realize how close you can get to that final hurdle and it can all Go pear shape. So, and how so once did you, how did you deal with that and still maintain your focus? Well, I went straight to the to the BOE um, doctor and they just cleaned me up and stuff. And they're like, you know, this will be sore, but you'll be fine. There's nothing structurally wrong with you now. You can still perform. Um, and you say, right, okay, this is the situation. What can I do to make the, the scabs heal quickly or not to scab up so I don't get you know issues with my range of movement? Um, but yeah, I guess just reassessing and moving on. But the yeah, the key thing is that once you get to the start line and you've been through all this, you know, four years, sometimes 10 years, if it's your main Olympic game or your one chance to win an Olympic gold medal, it could be a 10 year journey to get to that point. It's almost a celebration of, well, I'm here, I've done it. And 
I've got to enjoy this moment. And as it's easy to say that, it's not easy to actually enjoy it, but to realize, you know what, whether win or lose, or no matter what happens tomorrow, this will be over and you can relax. You know, this is the, this is the last, the very last point of this journey, go out and enjoy it. And, and, and it, is, it is a reward. It's a reward for all the hard work. The, the moment of stepping up there, you know, some athletes used to be absolutely terrified of it and used to dread it. And it, I can see why, because there is a lot of pressure, but equally, or opposite from my perspective, it was, do you know what, this is, this is a reward for all the hard work. You can step up here, you can soak up the atmosphere, you can soak up the accolades if you win, you've got the chance to win an Olympic gold medal, realize your dream, go out there and don't be afraid. And if you go out there like a lion, if you go sort of on the attack, if you're, if you're proactive in what you do tactically in a sprint event or a Kieran, you're gonna stack the odds in your favor. If you go in there timid, if you go in there frightened, then you're gonna let them take the initiative. So um, yeah, it was important to go in there positive, aggressive, focused, um, but, but ultimately to enjoy the moment. Good life lesson, right? That was phenomenal, mm. yeah. Uh, we've got some quick fire questions. Yeah, yeah, sure. With. So um, three non-negotiable behaviours that you and the people around you have to buy into. Um, timekeeping. I used to, I, yeah, I lost my temper a few times with certain athletes in the Why team. Why did that bother you so much? Because I think it's a sign of lack of respect for, if you're in a group environment and, you know, everybody's focused on their own individual goal, but you're part of a team, if you're the one that turns up and holds the whole group back and you've got your training plan and you've got everything structured and they turn up late and you can't leave, you know, it's talking about in training camps or in, in certain situations, then it throws everybody else's plans out. So for me, timekeeping was, was absolutely crucial. Don't just get there, bang on the time or get there late. Well, you arrived for this podcast on time. I was... I was a bit late. <laughs> no. <laughs> what? That's not late. But yeah, I think it's, it's a sign of, a sign of respect for the, the group. If you, if you show that you care about their timekeeping and their plans as well as yours, to me, that, that's a really important part of being a team, a team player. Other two. Number one. Um, non-negotiable, what was it, non-negotiable behaviour? Non-negotiable behaviour. behaviours. Um, timekeeping. You can't, you can't refer to yourself in the third person. <laughs> Even if you're None a third. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing annoys me more than athletes talking about themselves in the third person. Um, it's just, oh, yeah. Is that an arrogance? It's just, yeah, it's, it's the most pretentious, arrogant thing. It's just such a really weird thing to start talking about. Um, I think it's a sign you've 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 lost the plot. I mean, when I was, I remember um, it was David after Beijing. David agrees with that point, Chris. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> it was after Beijing, and I got interviewed by one of the Scottish journalists, and he'd heard he'd been in a press conference with Michael Phelps, and Michael Phelps had said, um, you know, one of the one of the American journalists said, so what? A lot of people have been giving their opinion on Michael Phelps over the last 24 years, but what does Michael Phelps think about Michael Phelps? And Michael Phelps started referring to Michael Phelps in the third person. Yeah. So this journalist asked me the same question, but for me, thinking this will be an interesting one. And I said, um, I think the day that Chris Hoy refers to Chris Hoy in the third person is the day Chris Hoy disappears up his own arse. And, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and they were like, Pfft. but it's true. I, I, yeah, I understand this is a quick fire round and it's not quick fire. Oh, no, great, great little story. Um, so uh, final behavior, I think excuses. You can't make excuses. You've got to take, take responsibility, not refer to yourself in the third person and turn up on time. Love that. And I'll be your mate. Love that. So next one then, Chris. What advice would you give the teenage Chris that's just started out on, on his journey? Believe in yourself and, and don't underestimate what you can do. I think everybody assumes, or I certainly assumed that, that, that people who are successful in life are born that way, they're different to the rest of us, they have it was their destiny, but that's a lot of nonsense. You know, I think people have the power, we all have the power to do amazing things. If you apply yourself, if you find a, something you really care about and you really enjoy, and you commit to it, and you do the very best you can every single day, and you really throw yourself at it, you will amaze yourself at what's possible. And it's not just, I've had that experience, so I think that's possible. I've seen it in so many other people, not just in sport, in all different forms of life. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, that is my belief. Go out there. Or I would, that's what I said to myself. Have, have self-belief. Um, you know, don't see yourself as second-class citizen or whatever. Um, go out there and, and be the best you can be. I really love that. I often talk about, before I got into Formula One, which obviously is a world of millionaires and billionaires, I used to think there was a secret mm. to their success. So as soon as I got that job, I started asking them, mm -hmm. how did you end up running a Formula One team? How did you? And all of them were like, a lot of hard work, a lot of sacrifice, mm -hmm. a bit of self-belief. And it slowly dawned on me, hold on, there's no secret. Mm. 
And, and I was and you, certain you, there was a, I was yeah, certain yeah, that he was yeah, there, not I would never you. be told, yeah. You, I mean, you do need a bit of luck. I'm, I'm not, you know, in my, my life, my career, I've been so fortunate that at certain stages that people have come into my life at that point to help me um, or that I've learned from or that have influenced me. Um, so you do need, you know, and we all start at different starting points. You know, we don't all have the same, you know, I was incredibly lucky that I had a really supportive family and that I was able to pursue my dream and my, my dream was something that was semi-attainable. Um, you know, you talk about F1, you could be a young, talented racing driver, but you need the money. Yeah, you know, to get yeah. to get into F1, it, it's not necessarily an attainable dream, but somebody has to do it. So, you know, you know, it's not impossible, but it's very, very difficult. Um, you spent your life working with a sports psychologist, Steve Peters. What is the one piece of learning <coughs> or the one thing you picked up from him that you think everyone should hear and everyone should know? Um, oh, so many things, Steve. I guess perspective in life, you know, he talks about um, when you're, if you imagine yourself on your deathbed and your grandkids are sort of coming to see you and they're saying, what, what is important in life? You're not going to say to them, it's important to race bikes as fast as you can on a track, or it's important to earn lots of money, or it's important to be really good at something. You know, he said, you, you've got to enjoy yourself. You've got to enjoy doing what you do, have a passion, go out there and, and be the best you can be. But, you know, it, priorities in life and understanding that you know these are all fairly trivial things unless you're saving lives then most of what we do is pretty trivial mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean to say it's not important and it shouldn't be something that you throw yourself at so once you understand that and you, you, you sort of liberate yourself with this feeling of pressure and of stress because pressure you can't you can't quantify pressure you can't go out and say well you know there's, there's pressure now I've watched you guys doing live tv standing up there presenting a show which I think, my God, that's absolutely terrifying, the thought of standing there and three, two, one, you're on air. And, you know, I think, how do you deal with that? And then yeah. equally, you know, you could talk to someone who would say, well, it's pressure standing up in front of their class to talk at school and do a little presentation. And other people that you would step up and, you know, race in Olympic Games, Usain Bolt, last and they're waving to the crowd, no pressure at all, and nice and relaxed. It's your own perception of a situation determines what you perceive to be the pressure. So how important is legacy to you then, Chris? Legacy, in terms of my own? Yes. Leg I guess, as I, I got towards the end of my career, I became more mindful of, um, I started, like my, my, the last, um, at the Olympics in London, as I got there on the first day, moved into the room in the village, my dad and my mum had put this little care pack together. What not to care about, it was like a, a little bag of things to sort of inspire me and to sort of just wish me good luck, a little card. But they, they put my first BMX race jersey in from when I was like seven years of age with my name on the back and this um, basically saying, look how far you've come. This amazing letter. How nice. And, and one of them was my dad had sort of totted up all my medals from every race, you know, World Cup races and Commonwealth and Worlds and World Championships, Olympics on a little chart and the numbers at the bottom. And you kind of look at that and you start thinking, you know, the, the, the numbers do mean something because at the end of it, you look back and it's, it's like accumulating everything you've done and saying, there you go, there's your legacy, yeah. there's your... There's your achievements, but they're just numbers at the end of the day. I think legacy, you look at someone like Graham O'Brien, um, who in inverted commas only won two world titles, but his impact and his his legacy and his lasting effect on the cycling community is far greater than than you know someone that could have won 10, 20 world titles. He's his story and his his yeah. legend lives on. So I don't think it's just about the numbers, it's not just about how many gold medals you win. It's it's about how you do it, it's the stories, it's the kind of person you were. So, so what would you like people to say about you then, oh. wouldn't they? Well, do you know, at the start, when you're talking about... It was always on time. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I, I guess, like, to hear stories like you are saying about Phil Hines and, and Cal Skinner and, and to know that you have the respect of your, your teammates, but also your rivals too. You know, now when you retire and that you can let the kind of guard down, you can let the... The mask down, if you like, when you meet your your rivals who've retired or maybe still racing, but you're you're no longer competing with them. It's when you see a mutual respect there. I really like that that kind of feeling of ah, oh, do you remember that race when this happened? Or and yeah, I, I love I love that sense of you know you've you've been through a journey either with somebody or against somebody, but you come out the other end and you can be mates and friends and, and still have that mutual respect. So um, yeah, I guess it's it's people at the end of the day. It's, it's friendships, it's relationships. That's that's what's really important. Um, so, yeah, I, I wouldn't want to finish my career and think, well, I've done it at the cost or the expense of, you know, yeah, he won lots of medals, but he was an absolute, yeah. you know, whatever.
I love that. I think that's a perfect way to finish. There'll be people listening to this who are constantly chasing perfection and chasing success. So I think to finish on the message that actually it just comes down to people at the end of the day and living a life that you can be proud of for all the right reasons mm. is, is the perfect way to end. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. That's been great fun. Thanks, Chris. Cheers, guys.